Welcome Brunswick families and Brunswick community. We're so excited that you joined us tonight for a really special event that we are so excited to share with you. My name is Gary Allen. I'm one of the middle school band directors here at Brunswick Middle School. And I'm joined with Scott Little and Michelle Wonk, who are our eighth grade band directors. And they have really done the, the biggest part of the rehearsing with the piece that we've had commissioned that you're gonna hear at the end of our documentary today. So the first question I wanna ask the both of you is what was so difficult this year about rehearsing in the middle of a pandemic and recording a piece that was written for us? What were some of the difficulties with that, Mr. Little? Well, you know, when you are working with a piece like this where there's all these different instrument parts and you're working with eighth grade students and so, you know, they're playing all the instruments that are in the band, you want to have as many of them in front of you as possible, but that was so right. totally not possible. Um, when we started rehearsing this piece, we were doing hybrid instruction, which means, as the students know, that only half of the students, if they were choosing to come in person at all, only half of them would come each day. And so for me, there were some days when I'd only have my flute players, I'd only have a couple of my low instruments, and then that would swap on the other days. So I would like try to choreograph if I'm going to do these sections of the piece on one day, because those the people who are playing those sections are there, yeah. or I'll do these other pieces, other sections on the other days. And it was just very hard to make it feel like we were working all the way through the piece with all the parts at one time. Yeah, that's really good. Anything yeah. else? Yeah, I'd absolutely agree with everything he just said. Um, and the other thing is, you know, a lot of the times the kids didn't know what was happening when those instruments were missing. So um, fortunately the composer provided us with recordings and those were really instrumental in helping that process and, and filling in those blank spaces for yeah. the kids. And something else about this piece is that um, it is a long piece but if you really kind of dig into it as I, I know you already know, um, it's actually not a lot of content. There's, you know, those four parts, three of them represent middle schools and then the percussion part. And so we could kind of teach, the way I would do it is I would teach that one individual line to all of the students, regardless of who was there, and then the second one, the third one, and then we'd start to stack them, which is really what the piece is. And so they kind of had that going in, and that was always nice. If it was a different kind of piece, it might have been almost impossible to record. Yeah, I know that you guys worked a lot together on writing out those, the, the three middle school parts. Motives is what yeah, we call them. Motives. Yeah, motives. Yeah, I know that the kids spent a lot of time. That's great. Um, so, Mr. Lee, why don't you answer this one. What, what is special about having a piece of music written for your middle school bands? What's special about that? Yeah, I mean, this isn't something that happens so much in like our culture now, but you know, a few hundred years ago, if you were performing a piece for the first time, that was a really big deal. The world premiere, like you get to be the yeah. first people in the world to go from the beginning <laughs> to end of this piece and perform it. And so you kind of get to set the tone of what the piece is about and what it's like. It's not like you're listening to other professional recordings like we might do for some of our other songs to listen to. Well, how did they decide to play that? We have to actually make all those decisions ourselves. And so it's cool we get to really be the musicians who have to think about those things. Yeah, that's yeah. great. So, Mrs. Wong, how, can you talk us a little bit of how this actually worked? Because we're going to have a virtual performance of the world premiere, as you've mentioned. How did that process work for our students? So, when we were all talking about what this final product would sound like, we were still in hybrid and or virtual learning. So, we never thought that we would have all of the students together to ultimately perform the piece. So, each student had to record themselves playing the entire piece through with a click track. So students had to wear headsets and perform the piece all the way through and then um, we took all of those individual recordings and sent them off to a sound engineer who then compiled them together. So it'll be really interesting to kind of hear the final product when all of these different musicians are put all together into one big piece. Yeah, so what's really unique is we've never actually played this piece as an eighth grade band all together. We've, never, we've never played it all together, <laughs> which is kind of weird in this year that we've uh, with COVID, um, how we've done this, but we kind of talked together as a team. We said, okay, what's the next best thing that we can do? And, and that was kind of it. So, so we're really excited to share this performance with you tonight, and we're excited for you to see this documentary to learn a little bit about Lou Vizentainer and Jack Willits and Maude Edwards and to kind of hear their stories and their impact for what really has set us up for Brunswick Middle School. So, we hope you enjoy a new beginning. March is the, the, the time of year when all of the settlers started to arrive in Brunswick 206 years ago.
The first settlers were men, and uh, they happened to be the same people who had surveyed this portion of the Western Reserve before the War of 1812. Well, they must have liked this community so much. It was a forest <laughs> that they came back to live here. And there are still descendants in Brunswick of the Fries family. Several of their houses are still here. So it's, it's really kind of cool to think that, that we've had this continuous thing for 206 years. I'm Sam Boyer and I'm the secretary of the Brunswick Area Historical Society and I also take care of the farmers market that we have in the summertime. So they came in March because they they usually left right after the holidays and by then the ground would be frozen so if they were bringing a horse and wagon or uh, oxen they wouldn't get stuck in the mud so often and they could maneuver across rivers. They were icy, so they didn't have to worry about wading through anything or, or being swept away by a flood, you know. And they found their land. The very first thing they had to do was to clear it, clear a piece of it and start planting, because if they did not have a crop by the end of summer, there's no place else to get food. <laughs> My name's Eloise Varaki. Uh, I was Eloise Craddock until I married. Uh, we moved to Brunswick in about 1945, I think. My dad bought a farm and uh, I started school in second grade. We had lived in North Royalton. I think when you're uh, raised on a farm, you become very self-sufficient because you couldn't. My dad worked a full-time job in addition to the farm. And my brother, the next one under me, was 10 when we got the second tractor and that was his tractor. But from the time we were 10, 12 years old, we did most of the farm work. My dad got up early and milked the cows, but then he went to work. We did most of the farm work. Hmm. And you learned to become a plumber and an electrician and a mechanic, everything, because you couldn't afford to hire anybody. As far as schools are concerned, this would be our 204th year of having school in Buffalo. We all went to school. It, 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 at the end, I guess it was Edwards, but it was that, just that little front place piece by the street. All 12 grades were there. When I was in fifth grade, we went to school half days, and that's when they built the elementary school. I came here in 1958, and there was the high school, which is the former Edwards Middle School, the three-story building, which just was torn down after 100 years. and. What was the Visentainer building was the rest of the school district. But it was following wartime and the GI Bill had just been signed. So there was a lot of anxiety about where soldiers coming back to town were gonna live. Some smart developers decided out in the farmland <laughs> um, would, would be good because they could keep them fairly inexpensive. Every year for six, seven, eight years in a row, we had to build one new elementary school every year because that's how many young children were coming into the school district. So it much, started yeah. exploding at that point, yes. Mm -hmm. I went to three elementary schools in three years. That's how fast the community was growing. I went to um, um, 
Applewood Elementary School, and then the next year I think I was tr transferred to Grafton Road School. We grew up on Hadcock Road. I, one year I went to school at the old town hall. It grew so much. I graduated in 57, and there was, I think, about 35 in my class. My brother graduated the next year, and I think there was like 56, 58. And when my youngest brother graduated, there was over 100. And when my, gra my daughter graduated, there was like six or 700 in her <laughs> class. You know, when we were growing up, you knew everybody, where they lived, brothers, sisters, the whole family. Then it slowed down a little bit, but then there was pressure on that side of town, on the, on the west side of town, there was nothing there. So Hickory Ridge was built, and, and that took the pressure off some of the others, uh, because for a while, people were going to school half days, because it just was so crowded. My sister-in-law said she went to school at the town hall, because they had, it was like overflow, they didn't have enough room for the kids. Just fast forward a little bit more, and then Memorial followed by Huntington. And so that, that took care of that. Willits came around in about 1976, I think, um, and is named for Jack Willits, the, who was the superintendent at the time. You know, I, I, I have to admit, it, it crossed my mind one or two times when I was here as a superintendent that maybe at one of the opening meetings I should take the time to go over mm. the history of the buildings. It's my regret that I never got it done. Um, but the people that are, are in this new middle school, it, it, you know, I, I think it's important that they know at least a little bit about the, the lady and the men who, whose names are attached in some way to that building, I hope. They know something about them. Around 1920, they started to build a new building. They built a three-story, the first portion of what we know as Edwards Middle School, opened for business in 1921. Hi, I'm Jim Hayes. Um, I'm pretty much a Brunswick boy, man now, I guess. Um, I grew up in Brunswick. We moved here in 1957. I went through the Brunswick schools. Um, pretty much, I think, three or four of the elementaries, and I attended both the, uh, the, the schools on Pearl Road, Edwards and Byzantiner. I gra actually graduated from what was, most people now know as Edwards Middle School. It was high, Brunswick High School when I was there, and that's where I graduated from. My good fortune continued because eventually I finished my career, my last 15 years as a superintendent of the Brunswick School. So I'm a Brunswick person, it's a family to me. I, I have had uh, direct contact and personal interactions with all three of these individuals, Maude Edwards, Jack Willits, and Lou Byzantina. Um, my memories of them are extraordinary because they were all extraordinary people. I guess I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Maude Edwards <coughs> first because she was my high school principal. You know, some people might wonder, well, well, Maud Edwards was a high school principal. Why is her name attached to middle schools? It's because that building was a high school for, for 50 <laughs> years. And I, I don't think people coming out of college, and they don't know a lot. And I think they need to know at least a little bit about the people that had such an impact on the district. There have been, in the last 70 years, I did some checking, in the last 70 years, there have been 13 full-time high school principals at Brunswick High School, 13. Maud Edwards was the first full-time principal at Brunswick High School and um, one of only four women that have been principals at Brunswick High School. Um, I was lucky enough to be one of them also. In the last 70 years, um, there have been 13 of us that have held that position and quite frankly, I'm not sure that any of us, myself included, ever met the bar that she set as a principal at high school. I think she was a pretty strict disciplinarian because if you were told to go in Miss Edwards' office, it was like, oh dear, <laughs> what's gonna happen? <laughs> but she was extremely nice, I thought. Hmm. She was extraordinary. She, if you talk to anyone that was a student or a, on her staff, I'm sure you'd hear things like um, very stern, but fair. 
she um, she would not settle for anything other than your best effort, whether you were a staff member or a student. But she always seemed, when she walked in the halls, she always walked like she had a purpose as to where to go and what to do. She just was very business-like. Mm -hmm. And to take care of whatever it was that she was looking at. But uh, mm -hmm. she was very nice. Yeah. She was tough. She was dedicated. And um, she meant business, you know. She, she provoked influence. <laughs> She had a, like a little smile, and if you passed her in the hall, she'd kind of just smile a little bit and nod her head like to acknowledge you. And I've told the story many times, and it's because it's been embedded in my brain forever. When I was a junior in high school in 1965, I uh, broke my leg in a uh, Brunswick High School football game, and I had a cast on my leg from my foot all the way up to the top of my leg, and I was on crutches for six weeks. Well, one day Miss Edwards got on the PA system and said uh, students and staff were gonna have a, a practice fire, fire drill. And sure enough, the bell went off, and I hobbled down to the, uh, into the hallway on my crutches and stood right at the top of the steps, thinking that I wouldn't have to go down because it was, I was on the third floor. Well, Ms. Edwards, of course, was patrolling the halls, and she came upon me standing there, and she said, what are you doing? I said, Miss Edwards, it's a drill. I mean, I have to, do I really have to go down all these steps? It's a drill. She said, she knew my name. She said, Jim, you get down those steps now. And she startled me. She actually startled me because she was right in my face, and I kind of like jumped back a little bit and lost my balance and I fell down from the third floor to the, I hit the landing midway between the third and the second floor and went down some of the steps of the, going down to the first floor. My crutches went flying, my cast, my leg was out because it was a full hard cast. The kids were like walking all over me and pretty soon she came down the steps and she said, I'm sorry Jim, but Rules are rules, and when we have a fire drill, everybody goes. That's how she was. There was no, there was no slack. I heard one story that I thought was kind of neat, and this is just hearsay, but she was the high school principal, I guess, at, well, at Edwards. And uh, apparently this one, I don't know, football player or whatever was bullying this other kid. And it got to the point where it was like pretty annoying. So Maud found out about it, pulled both of them uh, into her office and says, what's going on? And they, you know, he said, she said, he said, she said, okay, fine. I want you in my office first thing tomorrow morning, bright and early. So I've, I've got, I've got something for you to do. And they go, oh, so they thought the, the bully thought he'd gotten off, you know, Next day, they show up, and she says, uh, I want you to stand right here by the, the office doors. And it's, okay, you stand here, and you stand right there, about as close as we are. He said, okay, now what? He says, grab his hand. What? Grab his hand. <laughs> she made the bully hold hands with the kid that he'd been bullying all day day long <laughs> and was he embarrassed because all those football buddies are now going <laughs> that's the kind of woman she was but other than that let's see she left in 1965 she left she left the Brunswick school because she took a uh, professorship at Ashland College in, in the language department language arts department people were very disappointed when she left she had been gone for like 19 years, let's say, when I came back. And there were still staff members that had been there when she was the principal. And it was not all that uncommon for when I would make a decision, someone would say to me, you know, if Miss Edwards was still here, that wouldn't have happened. And, you know, I didn't want to hear it at the time, but thinking back on it, they were probably right. Uh, she was just 
exception. You know, and back then when I was a student, it was, it was pretty common, you know, because of the way I've explained it, her personality and her expectations, it was common that people complained, you know, that she was mean. But I've gone to many, many high school reunions um, from kids that were in my class and kids that were in classes all the way going back to the 50s because I was the superintendent for a while. And it's interesting because, you know, there was some complaining about her when she was there, but you'll never hear a bad word about Maude Edwards now. I think it was Lou, but I can't tell for sure, that had Edwards' name for Miss Edwards. It was the high school, you know. And um, he had two pictures made uh, and framed. And one day, a student of his, Joe Bilski, and people will know Joe Bilski's name. Joe Bilski lived at, her, he worked at Country Counter in Brunswick, and on his day off, he would come and he would sit with Lou in the afternoon and visit with him, and I was so grateful because I was still teaching and Lou was very ill. Um, and so Joe Bilski came and picked up Lou, and they went out and they presented the picture to the school. It was a great honor for the district to name a building after her. And I always felt a sense of obligation and, and um, duty, I guess, to really do a good job and to make her, her name proud as represented Brunswick as well as Maude Edwards. I had the opportunity uh, to move from the athletic director position at Brunswick High School after being there for three years, I was able to be the principal. My affiliation with the Brunswick City School District started in 2007 where I served as the assistant principal. It was an amazing staff at Edwards when I was there, just like the amazing staff that we have here at Brunswick Middle School. My most fond memories of being an assistant principal at Edwards Middle School were just the relationships with families. The wonderful students and the families that I was able uh, to meet. Uh, I've had a lot of those friendships I've had now for 10 plus years. I've kept up with people and uh, it's really just a great community to be a part of. The staff at Edwards Middle School were absolutely the best because every decision that they made was based on what was best for kids. I came to Brunswick in 2009 as an assistant principal, was there for four years where I worked under Kent Morgan and then was offered the position as uh, you know principal at Edwards Middle School and I was there for six years. I soon realized that the staff was so um, caring and supportive of their students that it really became fun to work together with them and, and to achieve the success that we did. It was a fabulous experience during the entire 10 years that I was there. I was extremely thrilled when I, um, when I was notified that I had an opportunity to, to work at Edwards. Uh, I jumped on it. If, if, uh, if the building didn't close, I would, I would want to continue to serve at Edwards. Um, it, was, it was a great community and, uh, of, of teachers and students. Edwards was a really well-established um, staff. Um, there, there, you know, there was some shifting here and there, but I think, you know, the the relationships that have been established among staff really run that building by itself. It was a really, it, it was a family. Edwards Middle School truly was a family, and so for me to get to be a part of that family for a long term as the principal was a real gift. There's an Edwards way of doing things, and I kind of caught on to that, and it's nothing but effective and positive. It's just an overall great experience. Before World War II, they started a building next door, and but war interrupted it. And so after the war, then they finished what we now know as the Byzantine building. That became first through eight, and then the high school was nine through 12. And then the boom started. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. It's your yearbook. That's my wow. yearbook. That's crazy. Oh my gosh. Yeah, there's the, the new school. That was the, the elementary school at oh, that wow. time. And that's what was Byzantine Middle School.
Yeah. Each of those buildings was also growing, but but then of course they started to put additions on them in different uh, time periods. They discovered a lot of asbestos and because some child had become sick in what is now the Visentainer building. So they shut that building down and just put people out, you know, in, in, in different places. So Visentainer, they did, uh, they just turned one part of it, the, the oldest part, which probably did not have asbestos yet, because asbestos wasn't common earlier. They used that as a community center. They honored Lou by naming the community center. And uh, we were so honored with that. The community center, people could be in it for short periods of time. They couldn't be in it all day, every day. Mr. Hayes said that we needed more middle schools, and he decided instead of asking the voters to build a new school, they would renovate Vicentator, which is what they did, and then opened it as Vicentator Middle School. people walk through the doors of the Visitator, they're going to see um, a building that they probably will not realize, uh, in some cases, is, is 50 years old. The cosmetic change that, that exists inside the facility is, is pretty dramatic. But you know, at the time, it was, uh, we, the, the motivation for that, we, we did the enrollment projections, we knew that the, the, the seven elementaries weren't going to be able to hold all those kids, and we knew we had to get the sixth graders out of there to get, make more room in the elementaries. And, at the time, it, and we did that, I think, in 94, 95, so it, it carried the, the community the district from 95 to, for 25 years, you know, it wasn't the best situation, it wasn't a glittery new school, but it, it, it filled the need at the time. A big thank you to all of you. We certainly could not have come this far without the cooperation and the patience of, of our employees, and my hope is that as we get through this first week, We'll continue to have that. When uh, the superintendent, Jim Hayes, he told me that um, they were going to renovate the community center and make it a school, I was so pleased and so grateful to the Brunswick School System for honoring Lou in such a wonderful way. Thank you so much. took me for a tour in May um, as they were working on the middle school the year before it opened when I accepted the position and uh, it was it was very shocking to me because I thought at that point there's no way they're gonna get this building open by August uh, but yet we got it done it was very nerve-wracking uh, going in with a new staff a new position I hadn't done before and a building that you know was gonna be very tight with the timeline to get it open everything turned out great Opening up Byzantine was very exciting. Uh, our, the three years I was there, uh, it was just a, a great place to be. The kids loved to be there, the staff loved to be there, we had fun. Uh, we built a philosophy from the book, the Fish Book, if you're familiar with that. Um, you know, basically, you get to choose your attitude, and, and they chose the best attitude they could have. Uh, I remember those three years very fondly. It was a great environment. Uh, the facility was not great but we made it a great environment. The culture and the climate there were wonderful. When I got the call from Mr. Mayle, because he was the principal before me, um, and offered me the position as assistant principal, I thought he was joking. So I didn't take it too serious, but I had to call him back the next day and actually say, did you offer me a job? Um, so that, I, that was a nerve wracking experience. I was very nervous. However, settled into the position, um, moved up to principal after three years, and loved every minute of it. Loved it. In the history of Byzantainer, since it had been reopened, there was only three principals, Mr. Mayle, um, Mrs. Yost, and then myself. Um, so I felt that it was a great honor. Well, one of the things that Nancy always used to say to me was, uh, I, I hear all the time the teachers talk about it, the kids talk about it, how Byzantainer is a family. And she goes, I love the fact that 
you've made Visentainer Middle School a family and a family atmosphere because that's really what Lou Visentainer was all about. It was a, a great time. We have great kids, great families, and so we like to joke that everybody is a Viz kid. So, you know, once our kids are go through our school, no matter how long or how short, they're a Viz kid. I think that relationship piece is what was the, the, the sort of the uh, foundation at Visentainer Middle School. The idea that we're going to take care of the kids emotionally and socially, and then we're going to challenge them academically. But you can't get to any of those challenging academic things until the kids know that you uh, love them and care about them, and they're supported and they're safe, and all those kind of things. And I think all of those kind of things embodied the spirit that was Lou Visentainer. My name is Nancy Visentainer. I am the widow of Louis J. Visentainer, for whom Visentainer Middle School was named. As of May the 7th, I will be widowed 32 years. Yes, Lou has been gone that long. I taught music at Applewood and I call it Grafton Road, but it's Kidder, but I taught there when it was Grafton Road. And I got stage curtains at both of those schools and I went to the principal and I said, where did these come from? How did I get them? The Brunswick Entertainment Company provided them and that's what they did. Any money they got from their performances, they gave back to the schools. So I said, if they are going to support me, I'll support them and I joined. And of course, Lou was the MC, and that's how it started. He remembered me from being the brat in high school. <laughs> and uh, we dated. No one knew we were dating. It was a very quiet thing. It was so funny because Sam Boyer wrote in the Gazette once that what high school administrator is dating a music teacher in the same school system. And it kind of came out then. <laughs> I had a lot of respect for Mr. Visitator because of his, his humility, his humor, and his honesty. He was such an influential man because he was honored and admired by so many. Um, as you talk to other people and learn about him as, as, and in what he does, it's his kindness and generosity that really touched so many people. He actually was the first assistant principal at Brunswick High School. In 56, he, he took that position. In fact, he took that position to be the assistant principal to Maude Edwards. Probably up until the mid-60s, he knew every kid in school, knew their name, where they were, who their father, mother, brother, sister, the whole family relationship. If he saw a student and they'd come up to him and he'd say, oh, do your mom and dad still live at a certain place? And what, what about your sister and your brother? And name them. And it was like, this is, this is impossible uh, with all the students. But he did. He thought the world of them. Well, he was great fun to be around. He, people loved him. Hi, my name is Bud Laird. I taught in the middle school for 30 years, 23 years at Edwards, and seven years at Byzantiner. And I'm Jean Laird, and I taught for 35 years at Towsley School. I like to tease the kids, I like to carry on with the kids, but that's how I got to know Lou Visentainer, because he was the 7th grade uh, Ohio History Social Studies teacher, and after a while, he would come up to me and he says, Hey, he says, you want to you wanna help me with a joke? I said, Sure. We had a language arts teacher named Margaret Sunhalter. She's the one who pretty much got the school to name the building after him years later. So he would say, hey, bud, did you hear the one about, now this is in the office at, at Edwards. He said, did you hear the one about the blah, 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 blah. I says, no, Lou, what was that about? And of course, I'd forget my lines. <laughs> and, he would, and we were doing this to, to, get, to get Margaret, Margaret. To, to, to laugh, right? So one day he showed up. You know, at my door, he said, 
here's your lines. <laughs> he had typed my lines. And he said, Bud, did you hear the one about the blah, blah, blah? I says, no, Lou. What was that all up about, Lou? And of course, Margaret, she's over there. She's laughing because we were blocking both doors. There's no way she could even get out of the office, right? And these were bad jokes. Oh, they're terrible. The worst jokes in the world. He but said, he loved those bad jokes. Timing is so important when you're telling a joke. And Lou had such good timing. He would tell the kids these jokes in class. And he says, I get more fun out of watching their reaction when they don't get it. Mr. Visitator was a character. And you, you had to like him. There was just nothing not to like. <laughs> yeah. We overlapped our administrative careers for a little bit of time. And I ran into him a couple times at administrative meetings. And even at administrative meetings, there would be a serious subject the superintendent would be talking about. And he'd have some kind of wisecrack. He was just a fun guy. We had a guy named Lou Ruggiero that when he retired, he, uh, he says, my first day of school, he says, I walked into the building and there's this guy standing at the bottom of the steps at Edwards. He says, hi, my name is Lou Visentainer. Well, this guy's name was Lou Ruggiero. And he says, oh, hi, Lou, my name's Lou. Hey, okay, Lou. He says, I went up the stairs. He said, I went to the office. And the guy stuck out his hand and says, hi, my name is Lou Tozy. <laughs> And he said, I thought, everybody's name is, is Lou here, you know, but Lou was just a wonderful guy. When my daughter, well, both my son and daughter, they didn't have him for classes, it's for study halls or something like that, but not an actual class. But because my name is Eloise, the family always called me Wheezy. And uh, we were at an open house at school and my daughter didn't have him as a teacher, she'd had him in study hall. And uh, I said, you know, I'll visit your classes, but I want to see Lou Visentator. I haven't seen him for a while. So we started walking down the hall and he spotted me. And he goes, Wheezy! And he comes towards me with his arms out, gives me a big hug, and my daughter's trying to disappear into the floor because she was so embarrassed because the teacher was hugging her mother. He, uh, I didn't know him as well as Bud did but you know he had a reputation for being the kind of person that if he knew you needed help if there was something he could do he would do it and, but he'd never let anybody know you know he was very modest and his wife was a sweetheart too he was a he was a war veteran um, he fought in the South Pacific in World War II and when he got home on the GI Bill I assume he went to Paul Wall's college and, got his degree and made a life for himself doing what he loved to do, teach and be around kids. I think he was the kind of guy that just wanted to make a difference. And I think he really did, not only for the schools, but the community in general. He was a good guy. He uh, went to Maude Edwards and said, you know, I this is really not for me. I, I, I want to go back in the classroom. I think it just hurt him a little bit every time he had to discipline. He had asked several times, uh, and, and they they said, no, uh, we need you. And uh, we had a new superintendent, his last name was Veering, and he went to Louis. said, do you really want to go back to the classroom? And Louis said, I really do. He missed the kids and being able to teach them. And so he actually went back to the classroom and that's a testament to what kind of guy he was. He didn't like paddling. He didn't like the discipline. Uh, the students loved him, but he didn't like that part of his job. To me, that shows a lot of humility. Um, because you know how people, you know, if you're, if you're an administrator and all of a sudden people see you back in the classroom, they think that you were either ineffective or you did something wrong. Well, he, he made that choice from all the information that I have because he wasn't happy. And in fact, after he retired, he made a comment to a reporter, it may have been Sam Boyer, uh, but he made a comment to a reporter in his retirement when asked why did, he, why did he go back to the classroom? And he said something to the effect that I went to school to be a history teacher. I didn't, I didn't 
go to school to be a disciplinarian. And that's a period, that's what he said. Because really, even today, you have system principals, that much of their day is discipline and attendance. And he felt, no, that's not me. I want to be a teacher. So I think that says a lot about him as a man. And so Lou said to me, since we're getting married, uh, I need to tell you, I have a chance to go back to the classroom. What are your thoughts? And I said to him, well, you better do it now because I don't ever want to know what it was like to live on a higher pay. <laughs> because of course he took a big cut in pay to go back to the classroom. I admired him, I loved him, I respected him so much, and uh, I was I was honored when he asked me to marry him. Uh, being married to Lou was such fun. Everyone knew he had a wonderful sense of humor. He kept us laughing all the time. I, I think he was the kind of guy that even though on the surface he was like lively and comical and funny, but I think he was very introspective. I think he, he wondered about what his life was all about. And my impression is he, he wanted to make sure that he was living his life um, the way that gave him the most happiness. That's how I would describe him. I, I think he, he demonstrated the, the character and the personality that you need to be a very successful leader. Gentle giant. Yeah, I, I would say genuine, funny. A caring person. And tall. <laughs> he was a, the, one of the giants in the, in the past of Brunswick City School District. I mean, there's some incredible people that worked in this district before I got here. That's why Brunswick's way it is now. It's just something that doesn't happen overnight. You build off the giants, the shoulders of the giants in the world, and he was one of them. I think he started in 51, and uh, he retired. Uh, he became very ill, and uh, he had to retire. So. Lou retired, I think, in 85, and unfortunately, um, he didn't live too much longer after, I think, four or five years. My children and I were extremely grateful to Brunswick for the honor that they bestowed on Lou, but change is inevitable. And as educators, we are looking forward to the new middle school. Mr. Shirosky has been extremely kind and thoughtful. And when we walked in, at the two entrances were the two rugs that said Vicentainer and had a big V. And I asked him for those rugs. And in the summer, on my patio, my table and chair sit on the rug that all the kids walked across as they came into the building in the morning. Hmm. And I just, uh, when I go out on my patio, I think of all the students that went through Vicentainer and got the excellent education that Byzantiner teachers gave. They were, in my eyes, the best. All the talk that I heard as an administrator was there was little doubt if there was going to be a new building on that property, it was going to be named after Jack Willits, because mm -hmm. deservedly so. I would say the thing I loved most about being at Willits was the family feel with the students and the staff. 
I really felt that the students were always um, placed number one. I had been a student at Willis Middle School, so when I started teaching there, many of the staff had been the teachers that I had had, and so it was really awesome to come in and be part of that staff, and they like welcomed me like I was completely a colleague. I always felt like there was a great connection amongst the teachers. We really worked hard to build a culture of family and community. It was a great building to teach in. Jack Willits, to me, uh, is a hero. Too. I, there was another administrator that I worked with while I was here who's sick right now, and very sick, and uh, uh, is in a nursing home. And he and I were very close. He said to me one day at the nursing home, you know, Jim, I, I, I think you were, I'm not saying this, to blow my own horn, but this man who I had a lot of respect for said to me, you know, Jim, I think you did a, a, a great job as a superintendent, but you weren't the best. He said the best was Jack Willits. Mm -hmm. And he's right. He came from Cedarville and started teaching in the Brunswick school system right out of college. Uh, and I'm not sure I've seen different reports of what he taught but he began teaching there about 1959. Hello, my name is Jan Roberts. Janet Willits Roberts. Jack Willits was my father. Oh, so much to tell about dad. He was able to communicate with anybody, anybody. <laughs> he was very charismatic. He liked to laugh. When I was, when I graduated from Baltimore Wallace College, I had several applications out for jobs as an English teacher and I was lucky uh, to be able to come back to Brunswick and back then the superintendent um, made remarks at the opening meeting and then sometimes talked to the new teachers and when the meeting was over um, he pulled me aside I don't know if he pulled all the new teachers aside, I only know that he made a point after that meeting to talk to me. He made everyone he talked to feel very important. And yeah, anybody that's seen this, they, they know me, they know me, they know sometimes I get emotional. I, mm -hmm. I'm a, I could be a crybaby, I'm trying not to be. But Jack Willis pulled me aside and he said, not in these exact words, but I know they're close. He s talked about um, um, how lucky I was to, to get hired as a, right out of college. He talked about how lucky I was to be able to come back to my hometown. He, he said something about, you know, now that you're back home, you have an extra responsibility. Um, you're from Brunswick and you're going to be teaching in Brunswick and, and he said to me I want you to make sure you tell your students that you are a Brunswick graduate because I want those students to know that kids from Brunswick can can make it and he he just made me feel special I was just a kid out of college and I, I know this is true because I remember when I went home that day I, I told my wife all about it it was just had made such a impression in my mind. Our pastor talks about how it's important that we provoke influence and people like Jack and Jim are the kind of people that provoke influence. You know, people look to them. He's the best speaker I ever heard in my whole life. You just sit down, I don't care if you read the dictionary. He could make it interesting. <laughs> he just was amazing. He was an amazing person. He was a man of faith. They had a very strong relationship with the Lord, and I think that guided, I mean, that's part of what made him level and even, and, you know, he knew who was in control. <laughs> and he didn't take responsibility for that, you know. There's somebody else in control here. We're gonna get through this just fine, so. He was hired here as a teacher in 58, and, and listen to what, what happened to him over those next years. In 58 he was a teacher. He taught two years at Center School, which is the old visitator. He taught two years there. Then he was moved and taught one year at Grafton Road, which is now Kidder. He was only there one year. 
Then he took the principalship at Crestview for two years, a brand new school. Then he moved over to be the principal at Towsley for two years. Then he was an administrator assistant and the board office for two years. And then he did two years as the assistant superintendent. And then in 1969, he was named a superintendent. Now normally, as a former administrator, when I see someone that's changed jobs every year or two, you, you, you start to wonder what's going on here. But when I do the res did the research and, and the, considered all this, it became pretty apparent to me that the district leaders, the leaders at the boards of education and the superintendents at the time, they moved Jack Willits to wherever they needed help. That's pretty apparent to me, that he was being moved because he was the go-to guy in the district. When we were in D.C., one of my first years of teaching, we were at um, one of the museums, and a man approached me and said, are you, the Brunswick, are you the Willits Middle School from Brunswick, Ohio? And I said, yes. And he said, I'm Jack Willits. And I said, oh my gosh, you're Jack Willits who we're named after. And he said, yes, I was the principal from this year to this year. And a couple of the other teachers around that time noticed who I was talking to and came over and we kind of had a conversation with him for a few minutes and he came over and chatted with the kids while we were waiting before we went on to the next museum. So it was really neat that in the middle of the country, here's the man we were named after, that I walked by his picture every day in the hallway. And so it was really kind of cool for him to be able to see us and be able to say hi. He had severe scoliosis of the spine or, or curvature of the spine as many know it by. He also had his internal organs were reversed, but that didn't seem to affect him as much as the curvature of the spine. Born without a rib cage and with a double curvature of the spine, Jack was robbed of the carefree hours most children relish. He accepted being immobilized on a stretcher from the time he was two years of age until he was nine. When he was 10, he was put into a rod stiff brace from hips to head. Although he seldom complained, he once asked his mother why the Lord sent him to earth as a cripple. She replied, the Lord has a job for some crippled man to do, and he chose you to be that man. He did not let it affect him that I was aware of. I'm sure it affected him as a child more, but he did learn to overcome so much of that, so he learned to work hard in everything he did. After you talked to him for three, four minutes, you didn't even notice. You didn't, you didn't even notice it. He carried himself like he looked like, just like you and me and everyone else. As a child, I didn't understand why everybody else's dad didn't look the same. I was not aware that he had a handicap. Everybody else's dad had the handicap. So his physical condition helped him to be a leader in the fact that he'd already had to be a hard worker in overcoming the obstacles of being handicapped. And then using that same work ethic, I guess, in using it to overcome problems that he might come up with in teaching, in being a principal, in being the superintendent of schools. It was ingrained in him to work hard at whatever he did because he already had to with his handicap. He would just write thoughts, random poetry thoughts down on pieces of paper and set them down. My mother would go along later on and find them and pick them up and just save them. After Dad passed away, all of those pieces of paper, many of those pieces of paper, were gathered together and I think an aunt typed them all up and they were sent in to a publishing company. But it was several years after he passed away that his poetry then was published. Some of them are humorous, some of them are thought-provoking, and some of them are just stories, his life. This is a poem that he wrote, which in my mind is a description of how he felt about his life. His name, his name was Jack, and this poem is called Jack's House. The house was leaning oddly, and seemed almost to fall. The builder had intended a building, grand and tall. By some odd twist of fate, no one ever knew just how, the house became constructed in the way it stands there now. The first floor was a high one, good foundation for the rest, 
but the rest were squat and ugly, twisted badly by some test. The boy who lived inside the house would sit in looking out. To live in such an ugly house would sometimes make him pout. His room was on the upper floor, his bearing grand and tall. To knock about those tiny halls, sometimes he'd trip and fall. The boy became a youth and the youth became a man. The building also aged, almost defiant, was its stand. Someday the house will tumble, but the man inside will soar and stand straight and tall forever for eternity and more. I think that's him describing himself. He was just an amazing man. Of course, my favorite one is the one he wrote about me. And it was because I had a deformity myself and had to go through some rough times. The little brook happily bubbled in the early dawn. Sun rays peeping through fleecy clouds sparkled on the spray. Then, jutting from the floor, an ugly crag, and all was still. Around then, hindered but momentarily, skipping, sliding, weaving on its way until the very persistence of undaunted life washed away the conquered structure. And again, this morning starts to wake. She greets again the bounding little brook and all its joy. That one is probably my favorite. Uh, my first year as an assistant principal, well, the high school principal said, we, you and I need to go over and see Mr. Willits. Um, so we went to his office, and at that time, the board office was in, actually in the Towsley Elementary School. So we went over to see Mr. Willits, and after the, the typical, hi, how, how you doing, and how are things going, he told us that he was leaving. And I, I was shocked. I mean, I was really shocked. He, again, he talked to me like, almost like a dad. I was, at that time, 25, I think. And he talked about how great Brunswick was, um, and how there were great things ahead for Brunswick. He used the term sleeping giant. Brunswick was a sleeping giant, and great things were ahead for Brunswick. Um, and he told me he was uh, uh, proud of what I had done. Um, and then he said, uh, I want you to know I'm leaving. He never said why he was leaving, and I didn't know. I just knew he was leaving. It wasn't until afterwards I found out he was leaving because he had applied for disability. He could no longer do it. Around 77, it got, his health got to the point that his doctor said he really needed to move out of the area and into move to Arizona. So this man, small in stature, but a giant in my eyes, was gone. And at the time, he had done all this stuff in Brunswick, and he, when he left, he was only 42 or 43 years old. So it kind of, um, it, it, it was shaking for me. I, I, I missed him professionally, and you know, when you, get, when you have someone that you look up to so much, and all of a sudden they're gone, and you're a young kid at 25 yourself, it, it, it kind of has an effect on your life. He was a lot like Jim Hayes. They're the kind of people that um, have the just the right kind of influence. You know, not for personal gain, not for you know political issues, social issues, none of that stuff. It was just um, because of who they were. People trusted. People trusted them. He had a way of sitting you down, and he knew you were going to get into something that was difficult to talk about, or that you were upset about something, and he'd find a way to distract you and get you calm down to the point where you could have a good conversation. He had to be the driving force with the, the vision to see where Brunswick was going. He, I'm guessing more than anybody else, was responsible for purchasing all that land on 303 where the high school is and Towsley is and all those athletic fields in the back and the, he I think was the one that saw we have an opportunity to get all this land and there's things that are going to have to happen here in the future when I'm gone. I think he was a visionary. I, I, I really do. I would say he was a magnet. People we'll are just him. drawn to him. Yeah. He just he was one of those people that 
you wanted to get closer and get to know and you know he no matter what it was you liked him he was just a, an amazing man that's jack Wills. So let's start from the beginning. The, the timeline of events for this um, actually started in September of 2016. It's when I applied for a EMP grant, which is an exceptional needs program. Basically what that does is it ranks the schools across the state on the need. They came in and did a study in Byzantine Edwards for the second and third worst rated buildings in the state, so we got moved right to the top of the list for the middle school. The third middle school was, though, in the top 10. So we qualified based on the Exceptional Needs Program, um, which gave us the boost to move forward with this process. So the state comes in and says, we're going to give you 37% of the project, $18.3 million, if you pass a bond issue. So and you have 13 months to pass it. Well, we were also looking at the, the problems with Byzantainer is still flooding, still issues. Edwards, we had problems with the foundation. It was safe, but there were some things we were going to need to do that was going to be substantial amounts of money. And the same with Willis. There was a foundation issue that we'd have to uh, repair in the near future. So we were looking at probably sinking 10 to $12 million in those two, three buildings in the next two to three years. Or we could build a brand new one and have $18.3 million from the, the state. So once uh, we did qualify for that, that's when we had to go back to the voters in November of 2017 to put on the bond issue to build the middle school. So as soon as the levy passed, or the bond issue I should say, passed in November of 17, we got working. When you build a project, the first thing you do is you do a, a you interview for a pre-bond um, architect. So the architect firm comes in, helps you through the process, gives some ideas of what you need to know, how much money you need to spend to build the building that you want. They don't charge you anything. And then after the bond issue passes, then you interview for a architect and a construction firm. So that process um, lasted um, to about February of 18, yes, where we selected our architect, which is TDA, or then Design Architecture, um, and our construction manager at risk, which is Hammond um, Construction Company. So from that process, once selecting the architect, once we selected the construction manager at risk, things started moving forward. And we started the design, and uh, TDA, the then design architects, um, started community involvement. We got our teachers, parents, students, community leaders all involved in what they wanted in the building, how they wanted it the design and things of that nature through what they call the visioning process. They would put something together, have a uh, developmental design development uh, process in which we say yes, no, remove this, take that away, let's add this to the process. And so that final blueprint becomes that submittal and this is what we're going off of. Once that was done, then they started designing the building to meet our needs. And obviously we were uh, very supportive of the teaming teaming process at the middle school. So that's what the building was built for with the teaming process. Went through that and the construction started, worked with the city. We, again, we had a tight timeline. The city was very cooperative with us so we can get things rolling. Since this process usually takes um, three years to build a school, we were actually building the school in 18 months. So half the time frame. We also had a tight site because we had to keep Edwards and Byzantine are open while we built the new middle school. A lot of concerns there, making sure uh, the transition for students was safe, making sure they're going the kids that had to go from Byzantine to Edwards because we didn't have enough room in those two buildings. Um, around the construction site was safe. Uh, we had to work with the city, and the city was wonderful. They let us um, do phase approvals so we could get the uh, foundation work done before the winter came in the fall of that year so that we could start out in the spring right away without having to worry about soil conditions and mud. We start right, right away putting the block up. And then uh, here comes COVID, 
you know, you're always dealing with finances and workers and all of a sudden COVID pops up and all of a sudden everything slows down, which caused a, a tremendous um, amount of creativity needed to get that building open and start moving students in there. To do what Hammond Construction and TDA and all the contractors did in the time frame that they, they did it in, I think is, is amazing. I've told people that have asked me, you know, it's probably, it, it's a good thing that I, that I wasn't the superintendent when all the planning for this took place because for me it would have been too hard. Mm -hmm. I might have been, I might have been fighting the progress because I would have been, maybe the part of me would have been wanting to hold on to the past. So it was probably good that, that I was not part of that picture, mm -hmm. although I, I would hope that my common sense and my eventually get the best of me, but yeah. it would have been hard. Yeah, the, seeing it come down, I, as I was standing there with uh, many of the employees, and 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 uh, school wasn't in session, and I you, you could see teachers and their families across the street watching, you know, and, and as it came down and I could hear them saying, oh, there goes my office. Oh no, look, the, the lockers are still there, you know. I told him, I said, I'm sad because, uh, you know, he put 30 years of your life in these two buildings and I said, to see it just come tumbling down, I said, that was hard, but that was a great building. It was a great building. It always saddens me to see any of those taken down, demolished, and yet the progress of going forward is also necessary. The first time I drove by and saw that there was nothing left, I, know. I wanted to cry. It just, yeah. it was pretty tough to watch because I, you know, all of us, even if you didn't go to school there, and I didn't, you still had all of those memories about all those other, all the stories we had done, all the plays we'd put on, all of the, you know, musicals, everything. We brought in the sixth grade first, then we brought in the seventh grade, then we brought in the eighth grade. To date, we're at that point of moving in. We moved in in October, part of it in October of what, 20? And uh, in a phase approach, October, November, and December of 2020. Seeing everybody happy, knowing that we're in a new place and then we're moving forward, I think is the best, the best part of it. Brunswick Middle School really is a state-of-the-art facility. Um, we've always had a great community and great uh, family and community support for our schools. Uh, and, but I think, quite frankly, uh, Visentainer and Edwards, while they were great uh, buildings to work in and they had great staffs and great kids and great families, um, those buildings were falling apart. So to have a state-of-the-art facility like this and have kids be able to experience learning in a very modern 21st century sort of way, a lot of collaborative work, that's very exciting about this building. It was built all with the idea of collaboration in mind, where it was harder to do that in other buildings where you had more traditional desks and you know furniture that didn't really move. It wasn't conducive to kind of have kids collaborate together. The old days of having the teacher stand in front of the room and talk and having the kids repeat all that back, that's gone. We want kids to work together and talk and be engaged in the learning, and this building was designed with all that in mind. It's an awesome building, as you well know. My name is Susan Pilchesco, and I'm the principal of Brunswick Middle School. You know, someone said to me the other day, well, would you make the same choices knowing you'd be in kind of an active construction zone during a global pandemic? You know, to come into this building in the COVID era was kind of, you know, unfair I guess you know we didn't get to have open houses we didn't get to have you know the the grand opening ceremony that we had hoped for and I said I have never been happier um, so just very grateful to be here and continue to be excited about the future I feel very honored and privileged to be a part of the initial staff that opened this facility as it's a gorgeous building um, has tons of potential and we've been given the unique experience to combine all three buildings and build this culture of what will be BMS for the years to come. My favorite part about being a principal here at Brunswick Middle School are the students and the staff. Um, like I said, we are big, we're 1,600 students strong. Um, even you know, with the pandemic going on, we're 1,300 kids strong. And they just continue to impress me every day. Um, they're going through a whole lot. Anxiety can be high for a lot of them from wearing masks to you know going hybrid to coming back a lot of changes And the kids are really rolling with it and are, and are flexible and really um, 
inspiring to watch. I think the best thing about Brunswick Middle School is that all the teachers got to come together in one building. I think that bringing all that staff together and then being able to now group all of our kids as one. We're no longer Viz versus Eds, you know, or anything like that. It's one big community. I've never worked with a staff that is so positive and engaged and professional and just kind of willing to do whatever it takes for the kids to be successful. And you know, you have little roadblocks along the way or speed bumps along the way, but, but overall, the way that the staff has tackled um, the coming together into a new building would have been a big project by itself, but then throw in the pandemic. And I just am so impressed with the way that everyone has um, kind of risen to the occasion. The beauty now is we've taken those three pockets of excellence and combined them into one. So the things that were the best things about Edwards and the best things about Byzantiner and the best things about Willits Middle School are now all in one place. Um, and I think that's really exciting for our kids and for the future of uh, the middle school here in Brunswick is all the best of all those buildings still live in this building. We live in this community. Um, I'm raising my children in this community. So to be able to stay here and to grow into a leadership capacity was really awesome for me. I, I think it's going to be, I think the, the students are going to love it and I think their parents are going to love it. I think what excites me most, there's so many different places that excite me, but um, the pods, each pod is a beautiful design for the teachers. Um, the, the arts area, the music area is just it's phenomenal. Athletic areas are great. Art rooms are beautiful. Uh, Project Lead the Way Labs. Everything a middle school student needs is in that building. Uh, what excites me most about the building is the fact that it was designed for teens. Um, and I think that's just such a vital part of the middle school philosophy of how we run things. Um, each, each team has its own pod, and I always kind of refer to the team as the family and the pod as the home. And I think it would be really daunting for an 11 or 12 year old to walk in here because um, it reads like a high school. You know, it's as big as many high schools or if not bigger. And it has as many kids, if not more, than a lot of high schools. I'm, I'm really proud of how the building is really this idea of a school within a school concept where, yeah, we have 1,600 plus students, but me as an 11 year old student, I'm really going to be in one pod with the same four teachers and the same 120 students for the most part in the day. And we know that that's what's best for kids at this grade level, at this age level. And I'm really excited that we are able to offer that opportunity for our students and our staff. And so the fact that we can take those 1,600 kids and divide them into 15 different teams of 100, and then they really get kind of that personal connection. I think is key. The plans for this building really highlight community and you know you walk into this building and you see this phenomenal cafeteria it's breathtaking. Walking in those front doors and then looking over the balcony and looking at that student dining area and then vice versa standing at the bottom and looking up at the lights and so forth. The favorite part of the building is the cafeteria. When you walk in that is such a greeting place and the colors and, and things that you see around you is so exciting that you can't help but want to go there and be in that, be a part of that. I love the life skill room, the special education area, going right into the cafeteria. I think that's going to be wonderful for the students with um, special needs to be with their peers more. It's just, it's so open and roomy. I love the hallways that have lockers in them. They're in the pods. The gyms having, you know, big spaces to um, have for our athletic teams and our phys ed um, classes is awesome. I think our, our the color schemes, our, our Brunswick blue, as you, you'll see, it's all over the building. Um, we stayed with the, the gray, the light gray, the white, and the Brunswick blue um, and black. As you can see, everything is coordinated, and I think it just stands out. We've had a lot of compliments from visitors. I was never a music teacher. I taught uh, language arts and, and uh, social studies. Um, but I think um, while so much of this building is fabulous, the part that really, where I, when I first experienced where I really went, <gasps> was the auditorium. I absolutely love the music wing. I walk through there, I think, wow, just a, it just the, the performing arts center along with the orchestra room, the band room, the choir room, they're just, 
They are a beautiful, beautiful addition to this building and I'm so excited for our kids who get to perform in those rooms. I think it's just a, an amazing part of this building. Our, our uh, Performing Arts Center and our music wing, um, you know, it was such a challenge at Edwards and Byzantiner to uh, provide that because we really did not have the space. And to have such quality spaces and a beautiful auditorium, I think will only continue. Our, our music program is fantastic as it is, but this will just make things take it to a different level. The facility provides an incredible amount of flexibility for the staff, for the teachers, the support staff. No matter what form of education or delivery you want to use, that building will house it effectively. Well, obviously I'm really excited to have been named the next superintendent of our schools. I'm really excited that the middle school project is almost complete. The fact that uh, our backyard, if you will, will be complete by mid-August. I'm, I'm so excited to see the activities that happen. I'm really excited that we, it feels like we're getting close to the end of this pandemic and I'm really excited to share this building with our community. I think the the opportunities that provide itself are, were, would not be available if we had, um, if they had kept, you know, Edwards Middle School or the other middle schools. And so I'm excited about that. I think it's something that the community should really be proud of, and I know they are. And it's just great to see the, the changes and the progress that Brunswick continues to make. I have had a little sneak peek, and it is beautiful. So when you have a chance to see this new middle school, there isn't anything that they don't have. It is wonderful and I'm so happy because I remember saying that they were gonna get a state-of-the-art middle school and boy, those kids have it. But I'm, I'm pretty excited about the, the opportunities that are gonna be available for the, the youth that are there now and that, that are coming through. But I'm sure that the, the kids that are there now and the, and the parents of those kids are very excited and I'm, I'm anxious to see it when all this virus stuff goes away. What I love most about the, the people in Brunswick and the community I think is their desire for their kids to do what's best for their kids to want what's best for their kids to work for that to strive for that um, I just feel like I feel this sense of authenticity here a realness um, people are going to tell you good bad or ugly how it is and then kind of help support through the bad and the ugly um, and praise the good. I think in almost every community, whether it's small or huge or in the middle like Brunswick give, I think, I hope that in all those communities, people think this is a great place to be. The staff members are very feeling lucky that to be a part of that system and parents are pleased with the, the, the community that they've chosen uh, and the schools they've chosen for their kids. I think that I think that's pretty common. But I don't think that takes away from the fact that it really is true here. It, it really is. I've been here 10 years and it's an enjoyable 10 years. Um, met a lot of people and, and the kids. Um, so it, it's been a it's a place that has been up and coming. You know, and, and prior to me getting here, it was always moving in that direction and it continues to move in that direction. What I love about Brunswick is it is a community from any of the buildings that you're in or at the board office or shopping around town. It really has that Brunswick pride. Now, one thing that comes to mind, and especially this year, I have been so just um, blown away at how, um, how much our teachers are able to adapt to change um, what we're asking teachers to do in this kind of an environment is something that no one has ever been prepared for. To take on these challenges in the ways that they have, um, kind of it's been a roll up your sleeves mentality, let's get to work and do our best. And, and I see it day in and day out with our teachers, it's just, it's just tremendous. I admire the, the, the teachers and the support staff in this district. They're not afraid to, to try something new. They're not afraid to fail. I mean, some of your greatest achievements come from mistakes. Um, and they're not afraid to voice their opinion. I mean, I, I don't like kind of guess what people feel. Um, I like the fact that they tell me what they, they believe. They have enough confidence in me to, to tell me their opinion and, and um, if they think we should do things differently. Um, they love the kids. They just, I mean, that's what it's all about. Every decision is, is based on a child. We put our kids first. 
and that is hopefully felt by our community and our parents that we always try and put our kids first. I feel like I get probably an equal amount of communication from the community regarding, hey, you did great with this. And kind of on the flip side of that, hey, did you ever think about this? You know, maybe this isn't working. Um, I really value that open communication that a lot of people feel. I think people feel invested in the schools um, and really do um, have their kids' best interests at heart. I always feel like that's kind of the, um, I don't even want to say ulterior motive, that's the motive. I think everyone takes genuine pride in being from Brunswick. Um, we invest in our community, we support our community, and you see that in the buildings as well as the community. So that's one thing I really love about Brunswick that I think is very special. You know, parents in the community are really actively involved in the schools, and that's why our schools are so successful. Um, it's not the buildings per se, it's the human beings that, that live in the buildings, so to speak, whether it's the staff or the students or the community, all of those things meld together beautifully in Brunswick, and that's why we're so successful. Our Brunswick teachers, students, community is, is top notch. It's the reason that, you know, I choose to live in this district and send my kids to this district. Um, there's just something really special about the Brunswick community. It's, it's hard to put into words sometimes, but um, just we come together, we unite. You know, we've been through tragedy, we've been through a lot together. And I think that we've learned and grown from that. And it just makes us that much better. And it makes me proud to be, you know, an employee, a citizen, all of that. It's, it's great to be a Blue Devil, for sure. Like we say, better together, we're in this together. And it really does take the whole school community and parents and everyone to um, to create a successful school. It's an amazing place and I, I loved every every minute I was in the district. Uh, just from the amount of support and the, and the pride that goes with Brunswick. Everything is very one big family, let's put it that way. We're one big family. Jack Willett said to me that day when I talked to him as a brand new teacher, he said something to the effect, we consider ourselves here in the Brunswick schools something like a family. And I think that's true. I think that the best way to describe the Brunswick school system is the, the family atmosphere that's here. Um, we celebrate with each other, we cry with each other, we support each other when needed. Um, I've seen that for 20 years. Uh, I can't say that's a common in most school districts, I've been a lot of school districts, but I can't believe it's as, as, as family oriented as Brun Brunswick is. I absolutely love the close-knit relationships in Brunswick. The people are, it, it's, you have a true sense of community and a true sense of pride in our school system and our, and our city as a whole. So, just the overwhelming sense of Brunswick pride is, is very unique, and I'm, I'm so excited to be a part of that. Brunswick is a fabulous community. It really is a community of families. It's a chance um, here that we really grow, and people grow up, and then they come back and raise their own families. We were a small town, and almost all kids want to get the heck out of town, you know? I don't want to live here. Well, it turns out many of them said that, left, and when it was time to raise a family, came back because, because it still has that the vibes you know whatever it is they're just nice people in almost every situation and I've had people tell me you know you were lucky to your family moved to Brunswick in 1957 because it was a great place to grow up I think it still is I think it's a I think it's a very safe community I don't think it has I don't think Brunswick has all the razzmatazz of some other cities, you know, but it's a rock solid place to raise a family. I, I, I believe that with all my heart. And I'm, I feel blessed to have been a part of it for so long.
Welcome back, everyone. We hope that you enjoyed learning a little bit about the history of Edwards and Byzantiner and Willits Middle Schools um, and more about those people. Obviously, three super special people that that we've had here in Brunswick City Schools and um, so thankful to take the time here to celebrate those people in those buildings and take a look forward into the future. So we hope that you enjoyed that. Now we have joining us Mr. Herwig, who is our composer. So uh, Mr. Herwig, go ahead and introduce yourself and um, tell us a little bit about this piece of music that we're about to hear. Sure. Thanks, Mr. Allen. Uh, first of all, for inviting me to, to speak a little bit. And also thank you for allowing me to, to write this piece for such a momentous occasion in the history of your school district. Um, so uh, as Mr. Allen said, my name's Jeff Herwig. I'm a composer from Pittsburgh. Um, I, please don't hold that against me, Browns fans. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, I guess a, a quick history uh, behind the piece. Uh, several years ago, Mr. Allen reached out to me with this grand master plan uh, of, of, about a piece that he wanted to write about, you know, three middle schools coming together um, and, and joining one another in a new building. Um, and it's pretty interesting because usually when I get commissioned to do something, uh, the commissioner doesn't usually have such a specific idea for what they want. And Mr. Allen did. So at the beginning of the piece, you'll hear three different layers or three different melodies that enter one at a time and sort of join together. And each of those three melodies represent one of the three middle schools that came together to form the new Brunswick Middle School. Um, and this was an idea that Mr. Allen had super early on um, in the planning process for this. Um, and it, you'll notice that each of those three elements can sort of stand on their own, their, their own individual melody, just like each school is its own individual building. Um, but you'll notice as they come in and join one another, they actually fit together um, and form what's called a composite rhythm. So all three of them, while they're their own separate things, they also form together um, and create a sort of a, a, a unity, if you will. Following the fusion of those three individual melodies sort of joining together, you're going to hear this unison rhythm that everybody in the band from top to bottom has that sounds like bum 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 bum. And the music gets a little bit more abrasive there. Um, a little bit more aggressive, if you will. And that's supposed to represent each of the three buildings sort of coming down um, in anticipation of building this new middle school. And then following that abrasive section, you're going to hear it transition into this more elegant and beautiful melody that's supposed to represent a new beginning for Brunswick Middle School. One other thing, as I listened to this piece a few other times, is that that melody that goes bum, 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 that comes at the very end again. Mm -hmm. I think that kind of, I'm a very like symbolic person, if you yes, can't tell. I'm aware. <laughs> <laughs> so I, that to me kind of reminds me of like, we still have that big, beautiful moment musically, but at the very end, you hear that section come back again. And to me, that kind of makes me remind me of like, we still have that history with us and we're going to continue to, and we're never going to forget about that history. Yeah. You know, it's going to stay with us and the piece will end with that as you mm -hmm. heard at the beginning. So it's a really special piece. And um, thank you, Mr. Herwick, so much for writing this. I think it's going to be something that we're going to be able to perform for years to come in Brunswick City Schools and super excited to share this with our community today for right now, our world, perform our world premiere performance of this. So we hope that you all enjoy A New Beginning by Jeff Herwig.
Um, start right now. Yeah. Um, you got you got say, is it going? I look at my notes. February of 18th. Can you hear my stomach growling over this? Uh, so for the two, uh, 2000, uh... I don't know. I'll edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm like, Donna, we're gonna go lunch as soon as this is done. <laughs> Anything at all. Um, and 20. Um, I, uh, let me try again. 2019, 2020 school year, I had to think back. Yeah. Right there. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so, um, so, Name, title, and affiliation with Brunswick. Yeah. Got it. All right. That was the hair of my <laughs> <laughs> Each of the the middle schools, uh, sugar. Uh, <clears throat> blah, 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 blah. Okay, look at you, not at the camera. Yeah. Is that better? Sorry. I told Mike Mail when he opened this building, I was okay if he wanted to name it Chirosky Middle School. That was okay. Was Is this that already recording? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and he said the only way he would do it is if it was called Shirosky Memorial Middle School, which would mean, of course, that I'd be deceased at that point in time. And I said, well, I don't think I want to go for that. So let's just stick with Brunswick Middle School. <laughs> 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 do you want me to get my cups out of the way here? Is that uh, too tall? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm looking at you. Yep. Okay. So I'll be down here. Just so we saw somebody at the gas station, what, a couple months ago. He says, Mr. Laird. He said, yeah. And I said, you don't look like you've aged today. And I said, I must have been pretty old looking back then. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure, let's think here. Yeah. Um, I wish I had half of your interview skills. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we might have to edit a lot of this, Gary. So following the, the um, blah, 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 blah. Following the- Anything <laughs> at all. Um, I'm I sorry. Do. I do, I'm, I'm forcing people to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I just, that's actually backwards. The mask. Oh, it's back. That or upside down, I should say. Very good. Right. We'll try not to move around too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, way to ruin it. No, it's I know. Like oh, I think still he, upside down. You probably had it right the first time. All right, try to make me sound intelligent. <laughs> I'll, I'll put some voiceovers in there. there you go. <laughs> Anything at all. Um, and then you'll cut the, like if I'm like, yep, don't use that. You'll yeah, like I'll literally edit everything out. Okay. Whatever it doesn't work out. Um, same question for Jack Lutz. Wait, we'll wait for that to stop. <laughs> okay, let's try this. I smeared some mind. on the chalkboard. <laughs> this is when we had chalk. You know, There's still chalkboards in the high and school. They're, <laughs> and they're green, and you put chalk on them, right? Is it better then? <laughs> I do have to tell you all that Bill Parsons jokes. He stole from Lou, just in case you didn't know that. That's, that's great! That's great! And cut!